Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Dowd. I'm the author of the book, Teaching Kids to Respect Others, Reflections, Activities, and Prayers on Bullying and Prejudice. I'm also a candidate for my PhD in theology and education at Boston College, and I teach theology at Anna Maria College. It's this last piece from the book that I especially want to focus on today about prejudice and racism. And I'd like to do that by way of a PowerPoint presentation with three parts to it. Uh, the first is to look at church teaching, uh, not just to refresh our minds about what the church teaches, but to generate some new ideas. Um, I certainly don't have all the answers, but I hope the presentation starts to bring ideas to mind about how to bring this to our young people uh, in Catholic schools and parish religious ed programs and faith formation programs uh, in youth ministry uh, and sacramental prep and wherever. The second part is to look at some of the contentious issues and terminology that are out there, such as implicit bias, systemic racism, and police brutality. Uh, and to see what is the church, what have the pastors of the church had to say to us about this? And uh, how does that inform our teaching, our curriculum? And then finally, how do we move forward? Have the bishops given us any guidance on the best way forward uh, in a situation like this? Do we have, as Catholics have anything to contribute to the current movement and conversation? And I certainly think we do. And I think our young people do. And so let's begin by taking a look at the PowerPoint. The first slide comes from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, they have a document called Responding to the Sin of Racism. It's fairly recent, 2017. And um, it's more, tr truthfully, it's more of a resource than a document. Uh, and I encourage you to look it up. It has a lot of links to other resources uh, that will help you to incorporate anti-racism into your curriculum as religious educators. And so they say, the Catholic Church is very clear. Racism and every form of discrimination based on sex, race, color, social conditions, language, or religion must be curbed and eradicated as incompatible with God's design. And then from the Second Vatican Council document, Nostra Aetate, the Church reproves as foreign to the mind of Christ any discrimination against people or harassment of them because of their race, color, condition of life, or religion. That's the bedrock of the Church's teaching right there. In fact, in Catholic social teaching, uh, we always say that the first principle is the dignity of every person that before we can move on to any other principles, we begin with the idea that every person in his or her uniqueness is an icon of God, created in the image and likeness of God. That in fact, we're all family because of this. Uh, this was brought forward and brought home to me best. When I was in college, I took a course uh, on jazz. I was an American history major and we had a music requirement uh, and so I thought jazz would be a perfect fit for my major at the time. It ended up being the best course that I took and some of you have heard this story before. There was one assignment in particular we were given that a few of us at a time each week throughout the semester would to go into Boston to this AME Zionist church and just simply take part in the worship service. And so when the Sunday came that myself and a couple of my buddies signed up for, we got on the tee and we made our way into Boston and we found this AME Zionist church. But ignorant as we were, we didn't realize until we got there that this is a black congregation. In fact, this particular congregation, I think, was 100% black, uh, which for a moment gave us the experience of knowing what it's like to be a minority, at least some semblance of it, uh, to not know if you fit in. Uh, or how you fit in, or if you'll be welcomed. But it also gave the pastor the benefit of picking out the visitors real quickly, and he came right over to us and welcomed us and eased our fears and, and invited us in. And what a great lesson right there. Just if you've ever been in that situation before where you're not sure if you belong or what the norms or what the culture is, and to have somebody as a guide, somebody to welcome you, somebody to say, you belong, come on in. Shouldn't we do more of that as church? 
How do we bring that into our religious ed programs, making sure everyone is welcomed, that the church is indeed the place, as Pope Francis said, where everybody is welcomed? Well, we got into the church and we went into the back pew because we're just visitors after all, and we don't know what's going on here. And pretty soon the service starts up and it was absolutely driven by the music. This was not a sit, stand, and kneel kind of church. People were standing, hands in the air, bouncing and dancing and singing, and the preacher yelling things out and call and response, and people were actively involved. And the whole first hour went by in a flash. I couldn't believe how quickly it went by. Uh, if you remember the old movie, The Blues Brothers, that's the kind of church I was in. By the second hour, I was completely into it. The music was filling me as well and pumping me up and driving me in this service. And the preacher called people to the front of the church to get prayed over. I went right up there. I got myself prayed over by the preacher man. And then finally, only in the third hour, we were all back in our seats and it was quiet. And the preacher, the pastor, went up into his pulpit and he looked out at his church, his congregation, and he said, now I would like all the brothers in the church to stand up. Well, all the black men in the church stood. And myself and my couple of white buddies who were there looked at each other like, I, I mean, I don't know. What does he mean by brothers? And I, I mean, are we brothers? And we decided just to stay sitting. That obviously he wanted to talk to the men of his church. We're just visitors. And so we sat. And I'll never forget that this woman in front of me, this black woman, turned around and when she saw us sitting there, she was startled. And then she looked me right in the eye and she said, why aren't you standing? And I stuttered my response. I said, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, are we brothers? <laughs> and she let out this belly laugh you could hear at the front of the church. <laughs> she goes, <laughs> well, what do you think you were, sisters? And it was wonderful, because in that one exchange, I got the best theology lesson of my entire life. Because what she was really saying, right, was, are you kidding me? In the house of God, there are no visitors. There are only brothers and sisters. In the family of God, there are no visitors. There are only brothers and sisters. Now stand up and claim your dignity. Claim your place in the family of God. This is our fundamental teaching about the dignity of every person. And working with our young people as they learn their prayers, for instance, we should really drill this home that if we can't see everybody as a brother and a sister, whether they're old or young, black or white, Catholic or Protestant or Jewish, Middle Eastern or African or Native American, whether they're sick or healthy, gay or straight, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're popular or not popular, athletic or not athletic, if we can't see every person as a brother or a sister, then we should never dare to say, our Father who art in heaven because we're lying. But if we live the truth of that prayer, St. Teresa of Avila said there's so much to reflect on just in the first word of that prayer. The first words, our Father, remind us of this fundamental teaching. I think we can bring that home to our young people. The bishops in 1979, following the civil rights movement, in their famous document, pastoral letter called Brothers and Sisters to Us, they had this to say, racism is not merely one sin among many, it is a radical evil. You see, if we fail to recognize God as Father, and we have again and again personally and as a community over centuries, then we sin. And the bishops remind us that we need to focus on that sin, not only as one sin among many, but as a radical evil. The word radical comes from the Latin word for root. It's the same root word as eradicate. In fact, that's what we're called to do is eradicate racism. Get it up by the roots. And that means we need constant attention. Can't just be one youth group event a year and think we're done with it. It needs constant attention. Those of us who are gardening, I'm taking care of a garden this summer, and you're constantly having to weed and get up the roots. The bishops remind us of that. Racism is not merely one sin among many. 
It is a radical evil. It needs to be eradicated because it's the root of so much other sin and evil in the world. This makes real sense to our young people, by the way, when we teach this, when we make this explicit in our teaching, not just generically saying we're all created in the image and likeness of God, but applying it now to this issue of racism. It reminds them that this church, this faith is attractive because the truth itself is attractive because Jesus, who is the truth, is attractive. St. Augustine said, the truth is like a lion. Let it go and it will defend itself. We don't need a whole lot of apologetics for this. Just teach the truth of the faith and it's attractive. Racism, the bishops more currently say, is an inner demon. This inner demon infects our soul as a nation and attacks each of us individually. It is ugly, it is real, and it is sinful. And in the next slide, you see them saying, we need to fight racism because it's the opposite of love. And what I love about this particular quote is if you look at the bottom, it says we need to ask ourselves each and every day, each and every day, this is the constancy of uprooting the, the weeds from the root. Who have I placed outside of my heart? And then we need to repent by asking ourselves, how can I show them that I love them? You see, the gospel began with Jesus's proclamation, right? Repent and believe in the gospel. It's two parts. So we begin with the repentance. If racism is a sin, we need to repent individually and as a community for our social sins of racism. But it's never hopeless. It's never just a, you know, a guilt-ridden thing. It's all about the joy of the gospel. Believe in the good news. Repent and believe in the good news. And the good news here is the good news of the dignity of every person and the good news that God is on the side of the oppressed. That scripture tells us again and again, God is on the side of justice. God sends Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. And people who have been oppressed, who have felt the heavy hand of oppression, have heard that good news. When we bring that to our young people, we affirm their activism. We affirm their commitment to justice. They recognize in the church the truth. They recognize that Christ indeed is the truth. We can bring this home in a number of different ways. In the book that I wrote, I suggest, uh, for instance, working on an examination of conscience. When we talk about sin, normally we do an examination of conscience. We prepare for confession. How do we do that around racism? Do our current examinations of conscience deal with racism? Do we ask questions like, have I treated somebody differently because of the color of their skin? Have I bullied somebody because of their race? Have I been unfair to somebody because they spoke differently or looked different? The more specific questions like that that we put into an examination of conscience, the more we're also preparing our youngest uh, learners to recognize racism is a sin. Not just a bad thing, but a sin, a radical evil. And so we bring it into our sacramental life in that way. By sharing the story of Moses and the liberating story of God standing up against slavery and helping them to see how much that meant, for instance, to black Americans who were enslaved that story, in fact, we have people like Harriet Tubman called Moses because of that story. There's a great resonance. When we teach them that stories like that and the gospel message were behind the civil rights movement. That oftentimes doesn't get taught in school. The religious aspect is lost. We have a chance to highlight it, to say it's people who believed in the gospel message who led the way because our God is on the side of the oppressed. And so we have to be on the side of the oppressed. We have a place in the story. Another activity that I 
suggest with young people to highlight the dignity of every person is to build the mountain of God from Isaiah to God's holy mountain. Uh, a nice project to build a mountain and to have people from all the countries streaming to it. And so the figures of all different skin colors and carrying flags of different nations together with their animals and make it a fun project showing that God is truly the God of all, our Father, the universality of salvation, what Catholic means after all. In James Joyce's famous line, Catholic means here comes everybody. Here comes everybody to the holy mountain of God. Uh, another activity in the book, I call it the days of creation. Uh, and you set up your classroom with helium balloons, and each balloon has a, represents some part of creation from dogs and rabbits to every kind of person on the planet, old and young, every different race, every different language. And the caption for the entire uh, classroom of art is, God said it is very good. These little projects help to drill home this fundamental teaching that helps us to be anti-racist, to raise young people who will stand up for justice and who will not take part uh, in a racist society, a prejudiced society, but will work uh, as many have in the past, and we've made such progress, but we have more to make. And the torch is passed, as John F. Kennedy said, to a new generation. Another thing to think about is representation. Let's look at what the bishops have to say first, and then we'll come to it. First of all, they say that racism is an intrinsic evil. We use that word a lot around abortion, and it's important for us to remember it's also true about racism. Intrinsic evil means it's something that is always and everywhere wrong that it can't be made right by circumstances or by intentions. It's just always and everywhere wrong by its own nature. Racism is one of those things. And they say to us, finally, this is from their most recent document, actually in 2018, uh, a pastoral letter against racism, open wide our hearts. They say, finally, too often, racism comes in the form of the sin of omission. When individuals, communities, and even churches remain silent and fail to act against racial injustice when it is encountered. The sin of silence, of being a bystander to the bullying, of not speaking out or not doing anything when there is systemic evil, when there is injustice. And we have to find our voice, uh, but that takes courage. In my book, I suggest courage multipliers to help our young people to find a voice and to be courageous, to not be bystanders. St. Catherine of Siena said, we've had enough of people telling us to be quiet, to be silent. We need to speak out because there's so much corruption, so much is rotten because of people being silent. Uh, and she's right, isn't she? There's a particular aspect of the sin of omission that relates to our classrooms, I think, too. And that's where I come back to representation. Just look at my little prayer setting here. It's comfortable. It's a beautiful setup, I think. Uh, it's my mother's, uh, actually. And I, I find it really uh, peaceful and conducive to prayer. The problem with it, from a more critical lens, is that it's also very white. I mean, this is typical of Western European and American religious Christian art. Uh, we have a very white Virgin Mary, a very white Jesus. We make the angels white. We make God an old white man with a, with a beard. And there's nothing wrong with that unless it becomes an idol. And it becomes an idol if we flip the scripture on its head. We are created in the image and likeness of God. We should not create God in our image and likeness. The mystery of God is conducive to every race and every culture, to inculturation, to having uh, wonderful Asian representations of the Virgin Mary and wonderful uh, African representations and Hispanic representations of Christ and the saints 
and the angels and God, together with the historical reality that they were Middle Eastern people, Mary and the apostles, Jesus himself, were Middle Eastern Jewish people. And we should always highlight the historic reality without also limiting ourselves to that. Uh, after all, the message is Catholic, it's universal, it's conducive to the diversity of cultures. And so this prayer setting that's wonderful for me here, I wouldn't use in a classroom. I would want representation, maybe a black Madonna image, uh, a collection of saints that are not only our white saints, but our African saints and our Asian saints, our Native American saints. Images of God that are not, as one of my professors calls it, two men and a bird, but instead represents the real mystery of God that can't be captured by any particular color or gender. Uh, we should really <clears throat> work on expanding the representation uh, in our classroom, I think, lest we commit the sin of omission, uh, where people, where we're not speaking up implicitly by the way we set up our classroom. Uh, William Zinak's famous uh, painting, In His Image, is wonderful. Remember that one? Uh, the painting of Christ, where if you get up close to it and look, you see it's made up of many faces. Some famous, like Gandhi and uh, Robert uh, F. Kennedy. Uh, Pope Paul VI, I think, is there. But when you step back, all of the faces of many different races and religions and colors blend together to form the image of Christ. It's a wonderful artistic representation of Paul's teaching in Scripture that we are all one body in Christ. The more we can do that in our classrooms, I think the more we're communicating something important about the Catholic faith. So moving beyond this, we come to the idea that anti-racism is pro-life. I think this is important. Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago taught us that we should follow a consistent ethic of life. He called it the seamless garment approach, that every life, because of the first teaching we just saw, the dignity of every human being, therefore every life from womb to natural death maintains and retains that dignity. And so our whole church is pro-life. Everything we do is pro-life. God himself is pro-life. We mean pro-life in an expansive sense of not only anti-abortion, which is important, we shouldn't lose that, but also of defending life at every stage. And so if life is threatened because of racism and discrimination, we have to speak up. How do we do that with our young people? We have a lot of prayer services and memorials for unborn children. We take trips to Washington, D.C. for the March for Life. Uh, do we incorporate the same kind of things about racial justice? Do we incorporate racial justice into our prayer services, uh, into our service projects, uh, into our catechetical units, and into our field trips uh, and our activism? I think we should, and we should be intentional about it. Uh, there's many other ways besides racism that being pro-life is, is certainly anti, being anti-poverty, working against homelessness, um, working against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. There's a lot of important parts of being pro-life. It's all integrated together. I'm only focusing right now in particular on the, the question of racism because it's a question that's being raised so, um, so importantly in our culture and in our world right now. The bishops say societal realities indicate a need for further catechesis. We have to bring it to our catechesis to facilitate conversion, repent and believe in the gospel, the conversion of hearts. Too many good and faithful Catholics remain unaware of the connection between institutional racism and the continued erosion of the sanctity of life. And then they say this important line, as bishops, we unequivocally state that racism is a life issue. We shouldn't break into camps that there's pro-life Catholics and there's social justice Catholics. That's nonsense. We're all pro-life Catholics. And if we're pro-life, of course we're social justice Catholics. God is on the side of the oppressed. Let my people go. Christ is pro-life. He came 
that we might have life and have it to the full. It's a false dichotomy to think that there's two brands of Catholics out there. Uh, we need to work together. We cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism, Pope Francis said after the, the killing of George Floyd. We cannot turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. And Bishop George Murray, uh, just before his death, together with the US Catholic bishops this year said, the fight to eradicate racism, eradicate that same root, to pull something up by its roots, is a pro-life issue. Racism is not a thing of the past or simply a throwaway political issue when convenient. It is a real and present danger that must be met head on. And so the US Catholic bishops say unequivocally, racism is a pro-life issue. And so we have our two starting points now, the dignity of every person, and the fact that that is within the context of being a pro-life church, not opposed to it, not a separate strand, but truly united. Uh, this is all part of the same gospel message. And so now let's look at racism itself, the terminology that we're hearing in the news and from protesters, and see what do the bishops have to say. The first thing is the term racism itself. Uh, oftentimes people get upset because we misinterpret what people are saying. When they say racism, a lot of us think uh, a bigot bigotry or personal prejudice. And yet the term is, has a lot of different meanings. And the one that's most frequently being used right now is defined as racism equals prejudice plus power. This is why you'll hear a lot of activists say there's no such thing as reverse racism. As a white person, I can have somebody from a, a, another race show bigotry towards me, be prejudiced against me, but because they don't have the same power in society that white people have, it's not truly racism by this definition. That's an important distinction. Uh, a lot of times when sociologists are talking about racism, they mean this kind of racism, where personal prejudice gets combined with power to do evil. And so Sister Patricia Chappelle, uh, the executive director of Pax Christi USA, defines racism as, quote, personal racial prejudice plus the misuse of power by systems and institutions. And that's important to keep in mind that distinction. I think it's helpful. Another term we hear a lot about is implicit bias, and the bishops affirm that this exists, and I'm pretty confident myself, if you want to read something about it, uh, you can read Blind Spot is the name of the book by the researchers who have done so much about this concept of implicit bias. The bishops say, racism is an inner demon. We are all infected with this inner demon. And they go on to talk about how it's put there no, uh, unwillingly or unknowingly by our upbringing and culture. When you live in a culture that has made black people the villains in movies and TV shows where uh, news uh, reports often show us black people at their worst moments, uh, all of a sudden, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously as a white person, I start to develop an implicit bias and understanding that black is dangerous, that black people are more susceptible to criminal behavior. I might not even believe that consciously. I'm consciously trying to be uh, against racism, but this implicit bias is present. Implicit bias, by the way, is a good thing. It's a natural thing, at least, and can be good. It can be bad. Uh, it's natural. It's Think of it this way, um, there are many situations that we run into where we don't have time for a well thought out response. We need a quick response. If I step over a log and there's a rattlesnake right there, I'm going to have an instinctive response. My implicit bias is that that snake is dangerous to me. And so without my conscious thought even involved, I don't have to even reach the point of making a decision consciously. Already my implicit bias informs a natural reaction to jump back or to freeze or to fight, whatever it might be. 
Well, in the case of the snake, maybe that's a good thing. But in the case of an implicit bias against somebody because they're black, that could be deadly. That's what we're talking about with police brutality, for example. Um, what if a police officer has to make a split-second decision and it never reaches the point of conscious thought? That police officer who is not racist might nonetheless, like all of us, have been formed in a culture that gave us an implicit bias. I worked for a while as a corrections officer. That was my summer job in college, in fact. I worked in a prison where most of the prisoners, uh, because of some systemic problems with criminal justice in our society, were black and Hispanic. Did I develop an implicit bias to think that black and Hispanic people are more criminal than others, maybe more dangerous? It's very likely I did. Here's the good news. We are not um, helpless against implicit bias. We can do something about it. And I like to use the example of uh, the crocodile hunter. You know, an implicit bias should say, you should, not, you should run the other way from a crocodile shouldn't be being the crocodile hunter. But he trained himself. Many people do this around other natural fears, things that you or I might have an implicit bias. They've eliminated that implicit bias uh, largely in order to do something, you know, conservation work in Steve Irwin's case as the crocodile hunter. It's just a simple example to say we can retrain our minds. We can work on as long as we admit that they're there and we're willing to find them, and that's a lifetime of pulling the roots up, then we can eradicate them or certainly work towards it and give ourselves a fighting chance that if we're in a situation uh, that requires quick thinking that's subconscious, our subconscious mind will align with our conscious desire to not be racist. Another term that we see it's important for us to make sense of uh, is systemic racism itself. I don't I have this slide coming up in a moment. Uh, but systemic racism means not just the personal prejudices now, but how individual personal prejudices over time, over centuries, built up a society whose structures were formed according to those prejudices and biases. And now those systems are affected by it, even with good people who don't want to be racist being involved in those systems. Everything from the education system to the criminal justice system, uh, housing and finance uh, to health care. We have systems that have been affected by a history of racism. We stand, unfortunately, on the shoulders of ancestors who were white supremacists. And as a white person, I don't have to feel guilt for what somebody else did in the past. But I do have to claim responsibility to say, I'm going to be part of the eradicating of what they did because what they did was wrong. And that's our commitment to social justice. That's our commitment to eliminating systemic racism. The church has to look at itself too. And that's this next slide. Uh, the bishops here in the US say, to our shame, Christians have been part of the problem. So as Christians, we need to be part of the solution. I think that's exactly right. Um, the next slide will drive this home. The truth is that the sons and daughters of the Catholic Church have been complicit in the evil of racism. In his papal bull, Dom Diversus, in 1452, Nicholas V granted apostolic permission for the kings of Spain and Portugal to buy and sell Africans, setting the stage for the slave trade. Uh, in fact, he, as long as they weren't Christian, you could enslave somebody, according to this pope. Even though subsequent popes strongly renounced and rejected the international slave trade, much to our shame, many American religious leaders, including Catholic bishops, failed to formally oppose slavery some even owned slaves. All too often, leaders of the church have remained silent about the horrific violence and other racial injustices perpetuated against African Americans and others. Uh, if you want two books to explore this further for your own sake, uh, I think the book, um, the book, The Sin of White Supremacy, 
uh, is really helpful. She talks about the issue not only of, uh, of white supremacy throughout history, but how it combined with Christianity and warped Christianity. We hear a lot of people talking about the warped uh, ideology of radical Islam that, that took over the, the healthy uh, understanding of the Muslim faith. And unfortunately, we have warped understandings of our Christian faith that sometimes for long periods of time affected the church. Uh, allowing even a pope to endorse and give permission for enslaving people. And another book that I think is helpful and we should probably all read is The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cone, which is a challenge from a black author who's recently passed away, a black theologian, uh, to white uh, theologians and religious people to consider the importance um, of the oppression of black people in history and to know that history, which sometimes we elide over and don't know as well as our black brothers and sisters do. This combines, we're not just gonna say, oh, the church is bad and we've done terrible things, although we have to admit it as Pope John Paul II taught us at the turn of the millennium, uh, the church itself needs to ask forgiveness and to repent of the things it got wrong but also let's bring forward our best uh, adherence to the gospel message. And so let's recall and renew our best history. The U.S. bishops say, since the founding of this nation, some of the strongest voices against slavery, injustice, and racism have been the voices of people of faith, from preachers to clerics to laymen and women of different uh, many different denominations and creeds, they have spoken out against this original sin of our country. As I said, the civil rights movement was driven by Christian believers. Uh, it was a faith-based movement, to use that more modern terminology. And that should not be lost upon our young people, and that should be brought to our catechesis, uh, especially in this era where we're dealing with racism uh, as white people, I think we're dealing with it again. I think our black brothers and sisters have never stopped dealing with it. And we might have our eyes open to the fact that um, we probably should have been dealing with it all along too. And kudos to those who have been. And so the evil of racism festers in part because as a nation there has been very little formal acknowledgement of the harm done to so many. We want to just forget it, as white Americans in particular. We wish we could just get past this or this racist past, uh, but unfortunately, it still affects us. Uh, history, as uh, William Faulkner said, history is never history. In fact, it's never really past. Uh, it's always with us. Or as Maya Angelou reminds us, in that wonderful poem that she read at Bill Clinton's inauguration. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And so the bishops are calling us to action. The persistence of the evil of racism is why we are writing this letter now. People are still being harmed, so action is still needed. Love compels each of us to resist racism courageously. It requires us to reach out generously to the victims of this evil, to assist the conversion needed in those who still harbor racism, and to begin to change policies and structures that allow racism to persist. See, we're getting to that systemic and structural evil, the structures that were built by our racist past and are still affecting us. And so the bishops call us to advocacy in the halls of government, that part of our Christian commitment is this proclamation of the gospel in a public forum, activism and advocacy for change, for a more just society. They say loving our neighbor has global dimensions and requires us to eradicate racism. It's rooted in that great commandment of love of God and love of neighbor a love that compels me to take political action and not just to have interpersonal non-bias. 
And so looking at these terms, structural, systemic, institutional racism, I'm going to use them practically interchangeably here. There's subtle differences between them. But the bishops tell us that racism can also be institutional when practices or traditions are upheld that treat certain groups of people unjustly. The cumulative effects of personal sins of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that makes all of us accomplices in racism. The roots of racism have extended deeply into the soil of our society. Racism can only end if we contend with the policies and institutional barriers that perpetuate and preserve the inequality, economic and social, that we still see all around us. We need to reform our institutions. And so they give credence to this idea that it's, we're not just talking about personal sins. We're talking about working together for a society uh, rooted in justice. And they remind us that this is social sin. So when they said in that last statement that all of us are, uh, are accomplices, what they're getting at is that even though we didn't do this, we didn't build these structures, if we do nothing about them, we're accomplices. That's social sin. I didn't do it, but I'm benefiting from it, what people call white prejudice. I, as a, a white privilege, rather, I'm benefiting from the white supremacists of the past. That leaves a responsibility on me to eradicate what they did. A gospel responsibility, because I'm doing it out of love. Not for political reasons, but out of a commitment to the God who is on the side of the oppressed, let my people go. Break down those idols, destroy them. The false idols that put one race above another, that advantage one race above another. And so the bishops say, today in our country, men, women, and children are being denied opportunities for full participation and advancement in our society because of their race. There'll always be exceptions. Of course, we have great athletes that have gone far and we have a president, a black uh, president uh, most recently. Uh, we shouldn't look at the exceptions, though, to deny that there's an institutional problem. We should recognize the exceptions were exceptional, but we still have work to do. We should see the progress. There's definite progress to say that we have had a black president. Don't deny the progress, but don't think we're done with the work either. The educational, legal, and financial systems, along with other structures and sectors of our society, impede people's progress and narrow their access because they are black, Hispanic, Native American, or Asian. What does that even mean? Well, I mean, in the past we had redlining, housing rules that made the suburbs white and would not let black people move there. Uh, we had a lack of investment in inner city uh, the inner cities where a lot of black people had moved. And as white flight took place into the suburbs, now you're left with a disenfranchised and economically disadvantaged uh, black population. That's in the past, but it still lingers to this day. The effects of that, we still see the segregation. Uh, and then we see it in the education system because it has an impact, right? Uh, we say education is the great equalizer. You can get yourself out of poverty through education. But then we base our education system on the local property tax fundamentally. And so that suburb where most of the white people went and black people were redlined out of for so long, where a lot of the wealth went, can afford better education systems, can afford better schools, better facilities, after school programs, tutors, athletic facilities, and coaches, and teachers, and AP programs. And the inner city schools struggle. Just read Jonathan Kozal, Amazing, uh, Amazing Grace. And you see the discrepancies and the injustice. And so can we fix the schools, at least if we say education is a great equalizer? This is what we mean by social sin. I didn't cause that problem. I inherited it, though. And so I'm charged with a responsibility to be part of the solution because racism is a radical evil. Those roots are deep. And as a pro-life person who cares about the dignity of every person, 
I owe it to every person to fight against structures that have made, uh, have institutionalized racist policies of the past. We must, in the last line in this slide, the bishops tell us, we must seek to resist and undo injustices we have not caused, lest we become bystanders who tacitly endorse evil and so share in the guilt of it. And the slide I have about racism and economic injustice just reminds us that fundamentally, economic injustice gets handed on. The biggest injustice was taking human beings and enslaving them, destroying their families, and using their labor to enrich a white population. And then even with emancipation, not giving any restitution for the harm that was done and no remuneration for the work that was done that built up this country. And so those who were already ahead economically, money makes money, and the money that makes money makes more money, continued to make money and to thrive. And those who had nothing, even though they were technically free, had nothing to grow. Much harder to catch up, to get ahead. Some did, but much harder. And then increasingly hard once the era of Reconstruction ended and the age of Jim Crow lynchings, over 4,000 lynchings. Terrorism, really, is what it was. Telling black Americans, stay in your place. Denying the right to vote. Denying full participation in the economy. Those are structural, systemic, institutional evils that you and I were not there to cause. But the bishops tell us we need to resist. We need to work for economic justice because the fundamental economic justice at the beginning, stealing people and stealing their labor, has implications to this day. And so we come to the role of religious educators. Here we call on our religious education programs, Catholic schools and Catholic publishing companies to develop curricula related to racism and reconciliation. Have we done that? Have we raised this uh, issue of racism to the publishing companies, to our pastors, to our DREs, uh, to our parish councils to let them know we want this to be treated in our Catholic schools, in our religious ed programs, in youth ministry, that we think this is important. And it's two parts, racism and reconciliation. I still find an awful lot of hope looking at another historical and cultural situation of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, Desmond Tutu uh, tells us, no future without forgiveness. A wonderful book to read and such a, a, an inspiring historical figure. But the two things go together, right? Racism and reconciliation. We can also learn from the example of those young people who rise above racist attitudes and model respect. I think they're leading the way. And so our programs are not about just delivering some content to our young people, but truly a dialogue, learning from them and letting them educate us in many cases. Uh, they're so savvy, for instance, with social media and how to advance a cause. Let's learn from them and make that cause the cause of the gospel. Uh, children, it reminds us, are, are not naturally racist. And the bishops also remind us that teaching respect for the dignity of every human person is critical uh, for combating racism. And so we're back to the start, that fundamental precept. And so moving forward then, the bishops give us this wonderful diagram, many of you have seen it, about the two feet of Catholic um, social teaching are the two feet of advancing forward on the road of charity and love. 
And one foot is social justice, where we remove the root causes and improve structures in society, whereas the other one is charitable works. We meet the basic needs of individuals. And the, um, the contention of the Catholic Church is it's both and. We can't move forward on the gospel way unless we're doing both. We need the works of justice to fix the structures. We need the works of charity to meet the immediate demands, the immediate needs. Converting this uh, same thought to the particular problem of racism, we might say that one foot is love in its personal form. That's overcoming prejudice. That's overcoming um, bigotry. That's supporting our black uh, neighbors in their businesses. But then the other foot is love in its public form. Uh, Dr. Cornell West famously said, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. That the greatest commandment is love. What does it look like interpersonally? It looks like love. It looks like charity. But what does it look like publicly? when we're engaged in the big structures of society, the economic system, the educational system, the political system, the criminal justice system, it looks like justice. Working for justice is an act of love. And so teaching is part of that. Activism uh, for just public policies, supporting organizations uh, that are working for racial justice uh, and electing officials who are committed to racial justice. All of this is on that foot but we need both feet to move forward on the way of the gospel. Concerning police brutality and the violent responses to this, I have a little bit to say. Um, I've already told you I worked in the criminal justice system as a corrections officer. My father, who recently passed away, was a police officer in the city of Worcester uh, for 42 years and did a lot of good work as a police officer. Uh, in fact, a lot of my commitment against racism comes from my father's example uh, of recognizing the dignity of every person. Six of my brothers, there are eight sons that my parents had, six of them are police officers in the same department as my father was. Uh, my oldest brother is in computer science, and then I'm doing my teaching thing. My six brothers on the police force and my dad are convincing evidence to me that anyone who says FTP, which stands for F the police, or says ACAB, all cops are bad, is not doing the work of the gospel. Those are not true statements. Most police go into police work because they care about the community because they want to protect and to serve. Most cops never want to ever pull the trigger on their weapon. Most are not bigots. And yet they're courageously in a system that has been bigoted in the past. I mean, the police were the ones who enforced fugitive slave laws. The police were the ones who looked the other way during lynchings and sometimes took part in them. They were very public spectacles at times. It was the police who were uh, turning hoses and dogs and batons uh, against civil rights protesters. And so, unfortunately, police work has a long history that was um, racist. And so good police officers, most of them in other words, are getting into a field where they're contending with that history and they're working hard to overcome the institutional problems. We should support them in that effort. We should support them and support those who are against police brutality. That's true too. Nobody can look at the killing of George Floyd and think that was a good thing. We should be uh, using our voices to stand up against that, to demand reform to demand that any police who are racist are gone and not hired in the first place. Improvements in training and whatnot. Of course we should demand that. But that shouldn't turn us against police. I remember as a kid what it was like to worry about my father's safety. I remember 
when my dad wouldn't come home for dinner on time or at the end of his shift on time, how worried my mother would be that something might have happened. And that, of course, transfers to the kids. You worry for your father. I remember there was a gang member who had a hit out on my father. His, to be inducted into the gang, he was told to kill my father. I remember what it's like to have a police car guarding the house because of death threats against my father. I remember the fear of my dad going to a riot And so that can't be dismissed without dehumanization. And dehumanization, whether it's against black people or any other part of our population or against our police, is evil. Dehumanization in history has never led to anything good and is the root of massacres and genocides. And so that comes into our teaching as well. Our response, the bishops, I think, say this well in 2018. Despite the great blessings of liberty that this country offers, we must admit the plain truth that for many of our fellow citizens, especially our black citizens, who have done nothing wrong, interactions with the police are often fraught with fear and even danger. At the same time, we reject harsh rhetoric that belittles and dehumanizes law enforcement personnel who labor to keep our communities safe. We also condemn violent attacks against the police. And so what's the answer? How do we move forward together? What can we bring to our young people and work with our young people towards uh, in this current situation? And I think the bishops in their most recent initiative called Civilize It have given us some good advice. I call this approach black and blue no more. Black and blue no more means breaking down the barrier as if there's two camps. That's never good. Division is never good. It's not a Black Lives Matter camp and a police camp. I saw a protest recently for Black Lives Matter uh, where there's been many where the police joined in, and I thought that was wonderful. That's the kind of unity we need for change. But at this particular protest, across the street, there were people protesting for the police. And it just baffled me that that's division. That's not going to get us anywhere. We need to be working together. Police see the problem as well. Uh, and we need to work for systemic changes, but we have to work together. Black and blue, no more. The bishops call it dialogue, and this is a rich uh, tradition. As Catholics, our strong tradition of social teaching compels us to be actively involved in the building up of our communities. This is achieved by being involved in the political process. And yet today, many shy away from such involvement because of our national, uh, our national and local conversations are filled with vitriol and harsh language often directed at people themselves. When personal attacks replace honest dialogue, no one wins. This kind of attack, no matter the reason, only serves to further divide our communities. What is needed is good, honest, civil dialogue. This means that we must treat everyone as worthy of being at the table, the dignity of every person worthy of our respect, and worthy of being heard. In short, it means treating everyone as our neighbor. You see, they root this in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Notice on the slide I highlighted the word divide to remind us that that's the very meaning of the word diabolical. The word symbolic means to unite. The symbol of our faith is what unites us in our faith. It's kind of the ancient use of the word symbol, that it doesn't mean a representation of our faith. It means what unites us in faith. So the creeds, for instance, were symbols of, of the faith, the things that united us in our faith. Symbolic, diabolic. Diabolic are the things that divide us. They're demonic. We need to recognize as soon as we see division like that, that that is not the will of God. 
We need to find a way to bridge the divide, to still talk, and they will be hard discussions, but it's the only way forward. Civil dialogue, the bishops say, can best be defined as the ability to enter meaningful conversation with people whose viewpoints may be different from our own, who have a different background or experience, or who come to a different conclusion about the best way to promote the common good. We wouldn't need dialogue if we all agreed. We enter into civil dialogue because we want to build a community that is rooted in understanding one another. See, there's some healthy roots. Eradicate racism. Let's put some new roots down where we understand one another. God's love for each person requires us to remember that someone who disagrees with us is still a beloved child of God who deserves our love, respect, and care. An important ingredient to civil dialogue is commitment to the truth. And the bishops go on to say, it doesn't just mean rolling over and we don't have a right to our own voice, but we also have a responsibility to be careful uh, in where, what our sources of news are, where we're getting our information. We should vet it carefully and make sure that we're uh, getting good information and not uh, propaganda. Make sure that we're bringing honesty to the conversation that we paint the other person with the best uh, possible light, the way we would want to be painted. And so we give the benefit of the doubt to the other person at the table and ask that we be given the benefit of the doubt. They say civil dialogue is different than remaining silent in the face of disagreement. Listening to opposing views is a part of seeking clarity and can be a creative process. We're building something new. This is, our, this is our constitution here. In order to form a more perfect union. This is our pledge of allegiance here. Why are we doing it? Liberty and justice for all. We're creating something still. We ask questions to be sure we understand one another and we can sometimes arrive at new understanding and even find common ground. What a wonderful, wonderful process. But they warn us uh, that it will be difficult. Pope Francis has recently said, uh, dialogue allows people to know and understand one another's needs. Above all, it is a sign of great respect because it puts the person into a stance of listening. This has been one of my problems with the response to Black Lives Matter. A lot of people have responded, not by listening, but by immediately reactively saying all lives matter or blue lives matter. Well, of course all lives matter, and of course blue lives matter. But the way that some people have said that was basically saying, shut up. I'm not going to listen to you. And that shuts down dialogue, the thing we need more than anything else right now. And so the proper response, as Pope Francis reminds us here, is the stance of listening. Being receptive to the speaker's best viewpoints. Secondly, dialogue is an expression of charity, because while not ignoring differences, it can help us investigate and share the common good. Moreover, dialogue invites us to place ourselves before the other, seeing him or her as a gift of God and as someone who calls upon us and asks to be acknowledged. And that's how I view Black Lives Matter right now, as an entire community asking to be acknowledged. Listen to us, please. Learn, hear what we've been through. Understand our perspective and our experience. We may not end up all agreeing, but the dialogue allows us to honestly engage and work together for change. Pope John Paul II back in 2001 said dialogue leads to a recognition of diversity and opens the mind to a mutual acceptance and genuine collaboration demanded by the human family's basic vocation to unity. Unity I highlighted here because that's the work of the Spirit. Division is diabolical. Unity is the very work of the Spirit. Not uniformity, but unity. Bringing unity out of diversity. 
bringing us together in collaboration, as the Pope said. That's the work of dialogue. Coming back to the U.S. bishops, they say, just like any authentic human connection, the process of dialogue is complicated. Have you ever been in a relationship? Often uncomfortable and requires vulnerability and trust. But isn't it worth it? Doesn't it deepen our love for one another? We must rely on our faith in Christ, who taught us that everyone is truly our neighbor. And so with that, I'd like to um, bring us to a conclusion here with scripture and prayer. I, I put a next slide up about my book um, for those who would like to uh, pursue it further. I have a lot of different activities to promote the dignity of every person uh, and to promote dialogue, even with young kids in my book here. But it's just a starting point, and you have a lot of ideas of your own, and we should continue sharing and enter into dialogue ourselves and with our young people, and of course, across communities. Um, black, the, the black Catholic community, we can read uh, wonderful books like Brian Massengal's uh, Racial Justice and the Catholic Church, or Anxious to Talk About It, um, Helping White Christians Talk Faithfully About Racism. Uh, Uncommon Faithfulness is another wonderful one. The Black Catholic Experience. We have so many resources out there uh, to continue our learning, to continue our dialogue, and to bring it to our religious education. And I hope my book might contribute a little bit um, as well. I'm always interested in hearing your ideas and improving upon what we all do together to promote the gospel, the gospel of life. And so let us, let us pray first by hearing the word of God, a reading from the Gospel of Luke. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. The Gospel of the Lord. And a prayer from our bishops. May Jesus Christ, who conquered sin and death, help us build a culture of life, where everyone is cherished. Amen. And then finally, let's pray together an Our Father and a Hail Mary, remembering that this is the prayer, the Our Father, that reminds us that we really are one family, brothers and sisters, and gives us a mission to live that out so that God's kingdom will indeed come. It's going to come, but let's be a part of it. And then a Hail Mary to ask us, to help us, to ask her intercession as the mother of all peoples, to help us to truly embrace everyone as brother and sister. Light her face up a little bit here for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you everyone for joining me for this hour and ten minutes that I thought would be a half hour. Uh, I guess I had more to say, and I look forward to our dialogue about these issues uh, as we as Catholics and we as educators uh, join together uh, to be part of the solution. I apologize uh, if I spoke wrong about anything here. Please give me the benefit of the doubt, too, as I continue to learn. And together, uh, Catholics and non-Catholics, black and white, Hispanic, Native American, uh, Middle Eastern, all of us together, let's walk forward as brothers and sisters. Thank you.